staring at my kid that I'm like, oh, I could just stare at these cute things all day. <laughs> so it makes it a little bit easier. Now I have to be that guy with the, t the kids' pictures or whatever. So. Other people's pets are pretty safe territory. All right, so I wanted to tie all of this stuff with factor scores, which are sort of out there, to classical test theory things, because they're actually the same quantities. They're just expressed on different scales. Um, remember that we have our y, true, y equals true score plus error, our total test score equals true score plus error. So we have this variance of true score and variance of error. Well, we, and when we talk about reliability, well, we, we can see this. Uh, the variance of true score, actually, the true score in a factor model is the factor itself. It takes the place of the true score. Hey, it's a factor. The latent trait is the true score. So the variance of the factor, now that's something that either you set or you estimate in CFA, right? You have, with the marker item or a standardized factor. Uh, that's your variance of true score right there. It's individual differences. It talks about how people vary in the population on the factor itself. Um, the variance of error, though, is a little bit different. That is the standard error of the factor score squared. Right? So if we flip back a slide, remember the standard error comes from the variance, the square root of the variance of that factor score distribution. That thing, that distribution, is your error distribution. That's where all your measurement error is. And quantifying it is the standard error of it. How much variance is there due to the error itself? So what we can do, actually, with all of that is that we can calculate reliability for factor scores using these computed model estimated parameters. And in just a second, I'll calculate that for factor scores, but I'll also calculate it for, for some scores as well using model estimated parameters, believe it or not. So, so it's pretty cool. Uh, but the flip of that is, why is there a caution on my slide? You can't use uh, reliability to assess, to assess model fit. I've seen this before, I've heard it before. Heck, I've had a couple papers where editors and reviewers have told me this. Well, yeah, um, what's your reliability? Or what's, you gotta show your model fit, so put a coefficient alpha in for a multidimensional test even, anyway. It's like reliability for a test only comes after you've established that model fits. If, if reliability can be found from model parameters, and model parameters are biased when the model doesn't fit, what happens to reliability then if the model doesn't fit? Not try, it's not right. It's biased. It's wrong. In fact, it's overly accurate. I think it's, well, we have great fit, great reliability. So that's where I was saying with the GRE, that's conditional standard error of measurement is the best they can do. That's, that's assuming a lot of stuff to make that work. Right? It's probably even worse. So you'll see this from time to time. Model fit and reliability get conflated. Reliability is a consequence of model fit. It's not an index of model fit. Please don't ever do that. Right? Coefficient alpha does not tell you how well your model fits. Anyway, so what are factor scores? If we were to put a term to it, the word would be these factor scores are empirical Bayes estimates. That is the term that's used. There's a prior distribution. So empirical means the parameters of the prior distribution. So sorry, ba Bayesian. What Bayesian means is that when we build a, a likelihood function, we weight it by how likely we think some of the parameters are to occur. Right? So our likelihood function here, this is our likelihood that involves the data. And we've got the factor score in it. And our prior that we're putting on it is that distribution that we say the factor follows. Right? So it is saying, okay, uh, somebody, if we have a, uh, let's imagine we have a standardized factor, mean zero, variance one. That means any time that we think a person's factor score might be above, let's say, three, we're going to downweight those factor scores a lot. Okay. So the word empirical shows up in front of Bayes because the prior parameters themselves are either estimated, are usually actually estimated as part of the model itself. Now, if we fix a standardized factor, that's less the case. We fixed those things. But the, it's the, the parameters of the prior distribution, the factor mean, the factor variance, are things that are sort of estimated in practice. The Bayes part means uh, we have to use Bayes' theorem to get at what a posterior distribution happens to be. A posterior distribution is saying, oh, that, that shape, that normal distribution for where the factor score was, that is after we've observed the data, right? So for instance, if we go and say, here is, our factor score F and a range of those. 
and we have our prior distribution looks like this right here. This is our prior, which I'm going to call little cap distribution of capital F. Right, that's the likelihood. That's PDF. We've heard about that in this class. That's our prior. Our posterior is over here. Right, this is if we didn't observe any data. This is our best guess of a person where their factor score will be in. But once we observe their data. Now we change our distribution, we shift it. We may shift its mean, we may shift its variation. And this thing is the distribution of the factor score once we've observed all of the items themselves. F given Y. And that's supposed to be a half arrow over Y to say it's all of the items. Right, so the items shift the, the influence of the distribution. The more items we have, the less the prior distribution influences it, the factor score itself. But there is an influence, and what we're going to see is that these factor scores, blups, if you will, are sometimes called shrunken estimates. They're shoved in because of the prior. So they're not excellent either. They have other issues with them as well. Right. Questions so far? Okay, so this is true. What we're talking about here for these scores, it's true for all CFA, IRT, multi-level models, mixed models, hierarchical linear models. All of it. This is same methodology. Same thing we see. So it's not some heretic. I'm trying to not make you think I'm crazy. I am crazy. You know this. I mean, you could just call me Dr. To crazy or Crazy Templin or something like that. Or I said no doctor, right? Maybe that's it. If you're going to call me Dr. Templin, you've got to put crazy in the middle there. Dr. Crazy Templin. That would work. Um, I want you to believe that this is not just me saying this. This is very commonly used. It's just not. In some fields, they don't recognize this. In other fields, they don't recognize the combination between it and scores. So trying to build both. One nice thing about my life is that I've worked in different disciplines and had degrees in different disciplines. And so it's neat to see the different focus, foci of each of them. So having a broader perspective helps me see how it's the same in different places. So what is Bayes' theorem? Uh, in your intro stat class, you may have talked about it. It simply states that the conditional distribution of some random variable A given a value of B. Now this distribution is like a regression, right? Regression is a conditional distribution. It is a found by a function of other distributions. The distribution of B given A times the prior distribution of A divided by the marginal of B. And a lot of times that marginal comes about through integration or for, categor for categorical variables, we put a sum there. For those of you REM students, or for those of you who want more math side, this is for you. Not just REM students. I'm telling the REM students it's important because I've got a newfound focus for your comps. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't want to scare you on comps. I want you to learn this. I think this is really, we're going to work, you were, if you're going to work in scores for most of your life, know what the nuts and bolts of them are. That's, this is my motivation for teaching you this. I don't care about comps. In fact, my comps questions, I won't even submit any multiple choice questions out of re re rejection to it. I'll give you a take home that you have to think about. But yes, there, there are no wrong answers and no right answers to. <laughs> How about that? That's a good comps question. Anyway, um, what are all these terms? The distribution on the left hand side of the equals, this thing over here, is the posterior distribution. That's going to be our factor score thing right here. The distribution at the top that we get it from, the main source of it, this thing, is the distribution of the data given the factor itself. That's your model. That is your model likelihood. The, 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 the ML people and the Bayesian don't see eye to eye. And the, but the funny thing is this term right here in Bayes is called a, lo a likelihood function in ML. It's identical. right? And that's what we've been working with this whole time. And then this term right here, f of a, is the prior. So if we put all that together, we have the following. Uh, the bold is for matrices. Now, this part of the slides is technical. This is for those of you in my program and wanting to know math. For those of you who want to just follow along, it's cool. I'm not trying to, I, I know that this class sits with multiple measures. I got to tell you, that quote I just put from you from Pierce on there fires me up to be. To, I have a duty to teach those of you in my program to, to know this stuff. And for those of you who want to learn more of it, knowledge never hurts. So let me show you this. This, this will give you experience working with distributions, Bayesian statistics, and multi multivariate normal is really what this next set of slides are for. 
Once we get done with these slides, we'll get back to factor scores and numbers coming back. So if you're not in a technical thing, that's cool. I get it. I haven't been either. I actually had, I learned a lot building this lecture. So these are things I wish I had known earlier. Okay, so this is Bayes' theorem. The distribution of all of our factors, bold face meaning it's a vector, it's maybe we have more of them, given all of our data, is given by our model times our prior for the factor times our likelihood of the data. And we can decompose each of those or, or disentangle each of those one at a time. Let's start with the, dis the model itself, since that seems to be what we focused on the whole time. Remember in our CFA, we have a model for an item. This is one, I'm using one factor right now. Um, this implies that the data conditional on the factor are normally distributed. The mean of that distribution is the predicted value of the regression. The variance of that distribution is the variance of the error term. Right. So that's, that literally is the data. That's one part of that distribution. If we swap this out and say, well, wait, wait a minute, we have more than one y, then that one univariate normal distribution becomes a multivariate normal distribution. And that's what this terminology down here is. We have a mean vector for all the items plus our matrix of factor loadings times our factor plus our diagonal matrix of unique variances. And if we have multiple factors, then we swap out the scalar factor here for all of that. But basically, this thing is multivariate normal, and it's given by our distributional assumptions. Right? In IRT, when you take that class, it's not multivariate normal. It's a product across a bunch of Bernoulli distributions for, for binary items. So if you do take another class, you'll see that again, or if you have taken it. So the other pieces here, what is the distribution of the factor? That one's probably the quickest one we can do. For a single factor, it's normal with some factor mean and factor variance. I left the factor mean and factor variance in my slides because this is going to apply for any standardization that you pick. You can actually sync up some of these slides with the R syntax. I'm going to use some of the matrix forms in R if you want to go through this. And that syntax will work whether you standardize the factor or whether you I, marker, marker variable identify the model. Uh, but I, to do that in notation, I needed to have the placeholders there. So if you standardize the factor, you know that this will be a mean zero variance one. If you estimate it with a mean zero, maybe you have an estimated there. It may look like that. So that's for a normal distribution for one factor. For multivariate, it, if we have capital K factors, we have a multivariate normal with a factor mean vector and our phi, which is our estimated variance and covariance matrix of our factors themselves. It's how correlated or covar how much they covary. It's estimated in quotes because sometimes the diagonal is standardized. So we have ones down the diagonal and all the correlations are estimated. And sometimes all of it's estimated. So we've got all the pieces there. How do we get to Y? why the data itself turn out to be multivariate normal. And remember, if you remember the matrix forms when I introduced that terrible lecture with introduced CFA, I, we, before I gave you the types of identification, we said, oh, wait, once we, once we look at a model, it implies certain things about our data. It's saying if we believe the, fa if the ma factor model fits, our data should look of a certain form. They should be multivariate normal across all the items. The mean vector should be the overall item mean, and if we have a factor mean, that should contribute, but most of the time that's zero, right? So our mean vector is given by all of our item intercepts, or our item means. And this box on the right here, this is our factor co our, our, our data's covariance matrix. And this was the idea that I put on the board where I tried to show you the block. When there's no factor covariance and we have multiple factors, there's a zero in the, the kind of the off-diagonal section of items that don't overlap on the factors they measure, right? So all these are multivariate normal in CFA, which makes the next step of getting to what this distribution is amazing. Why is it amazing? Because if you're in IRT, you have to integrate or you have to maximize. If you're in not CFA, if you're for Poisson distribution, put a Cauchy in there, you'll have to integrate or you'll have to find a maximization algorithm to work. But with multivariate normal and with normal distributions, the world is amazing. We can actually find a distribution, show its form, show what its mean should be, show what its variance should be. 
So quick primer, a reminder about distributions. Remember, a conditional distribution, if we have random variable z and a random variable x, the conditional distribution is noted as f of z given x. We find it by looking at a joint distribution or things that occur simultaneously, like a multivariate normal would be, divided by a marginal distribution. So I'm working up to the part that our joint distribution itself comes from the product of a marginal, or sorry, a conditional times its margin of the conditioning variable. So going back a slide, what's that mean? The numerator over here, this thing, that represents the joint distribution of our data and our factors all together. Remember joint distribution, remember joint multivariate normal means what's the likelihood of observing all everything simultaneously. So it's like if we could observe the factor, it's in the multivariate normal along with the data itself. Right? So it's just this extra dimensions to multivariate normal that we're used to. And I'm doing that because the next slide talks about a key property of multivariate normal. Right? Actually, let me back up a second. This right here is joint, right? This is marginal. And what we're after is this conditional distribution of f given y. Because everything is multivariate normal, we can use this property of multivariate normal distributions to show that conditional distributions of things that are multivariate normal are also multivariate normal. And that's what we can use to to prove that the factor score distribution under CFA, should the model fit, is normal. Which is pretty cool. Yeah, Devane. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Maybe. Where did I start? <laughs> Let me have a sip first. So, what we're getting to is we're after, we're after this posterior distribution of the factor given our data. Right? And we don't necessarily know that it's normal yet. In most things, it isn't normal, actually. I've just been telling you it's going to be normal. We're going, the way we can prove it in CFA is through the, the idea of what a multivariate normal distribution does. Right? What we're going to show is that this numerator here is a joint distribution of f and y. So f and y together are multivariate normal. And if we have f and y are as multivariate normal, once we condition on some of those variables, right, make a conditional distribution out of them, the rest of the, that distribution itself is also multivariate normal. And the math for it works out because of the functional form of the multivariate normal. You've got this exponent, you've got a log, and exponents and logs all work together to give you really easy to work with terms compared to some of these distributions that are just like the chi-square of tops that I had up here has nasty stuff in it. So does that help? Okay. So what we can show is this joint distribution is, multi is, is multivariate normal. Then we can use the above result um, to show that the posterior distribution is also multivariate normal. I just said all this. So how does that work? If you Wiki go to Wikipedia's page on multivariate normal, you can see this information right here. It's under the conditional distributions part. But let's imagine we take all of our data right here. I'm going to call, eventually call this side Y and this side F. And we put it into a big data matrix where the first I columns of it are the observations and the next K columns of it are the factors, if we could observe them. They're hypothetical right now. But, right? So we have this huge data matrix now. I'm going to now augment the matrix. The word matrix augmentation, that just means I'm going to draw a line down the middle of it. The item side I'm going to call X1. The factor side, I'm going to call x2. Right. So if the data are multivariate normal, we have a mean vector, and we can augment it as well. We can call the item side mu1, the factor side mu2. And the same thing goes with the covariance matrix, right? We can have the, the top corner of it be the covariance matrix of all the data. So we can observe that, although our model is actually trying to give it to us. So we can't use our model parameter estimates. We have the covariance matrix of only the factors in the bottom corner. And then we have the covariance matrix of items versus factors along the off-diagonal terms. All right, so with each of those six things I circled at the bottom, we can figure out the new mean vector, the new covariance matrix of this posterior distribution. And this comes from this following form. The distribution 
of one multivariate normal thing conditioned on another, is multivariate normal, the mean of it comes from the mean vector of the first times this matrix product of all the other stuff. Here are the data from the second part. Here's the mean of the second part. All right, this is going to be our form for the factor mean vector that we see. The mean of our factor distribution is going to be given by this weird thing. What's the covariance matrix? It's the same functional form. It, it, it works a little bit differently. To figure out the covariance matrix, if we have more than one factor, if we have one factor, it's the, it's the standard error that's in the, or the variance that's in that term. It comes from each of the four quadrants of the covariance matrix on the previous slide, but you can see it as well. So, so once we get to it, it's all poetry, right? What we're looking for, sorry, when I, it took me forever. This took me 10 years to look at. If you can't get it today, it's totally cool. But once you get it, it's like, holy cow, you can't unsee it again. It's like putting that puzzle piece in. All right, it's like, this is, this is cool. So uh, for me, uh, hopefully we'll get back to the other part that's cool for, the, for everybody else. But uh, anyway, if we take our data and our pretend factors and put it, put it like this, then we have, based on our model, each of these components, all right? The mean of the y given our, our data is given by what our model says it should be. The mean of the factors are given by how we figured out the factor mean should be it. The covariance matrix of the data, that's lambda phi, lambda transpose plus psi. I may or may not have a tattoo of that. And uh, the factor covariance matrix is just phi itself, another tattoo of mine. The off diagonal is uh, given by the product of phi times lambda. So putting that together, we know the factor mean is going to be multivariate normal once we condition on y. And here's the mean of it. Oh, God, that's ugly. Look at all those matrices. I remember looking at this at first and thinking, how the hell did they come up with it? But you, have to, you sort of have to make chunks of all of it, right? This term right here is just this covariance matrix of the model implied data, the model implied data covariance matrix, right? This is this portion. But let's take a look at what the, the mean happens to be. Remember, the mean is kind of our, our, going to be our estimate of f. That's our factor score. It takes our data, subtracts off the mean of the data from it, so it essentially centralizes the data, and then reweights how far off a person is from their overall mean based on variation due to the model and the factor and so forth. How precise our estimates actually are for the factor. Our covariance of it is not, e is not any better, but this is, again, chunked into different sections. This is that part. This section is right here. This section is right here. And this middle section is the top part. So once you, if you can break it into the, the component parts and put a different symbol there, it's easier to parse your way through it. Whew! WTF Templin, right? Sorry, I get a kick out of that. I've never presented this before, maybe never presented again. Questions on this real quick. Now, this is all assuming, again, that our data are multivariate normal. And that's a tough assumption for Likert-type data. But if it is true, then all this holds. <laughs> I don't know, it's like one of those things where, okay, so you want to know what your, this is a method that um, came up, people came up with. Um, you'll see in the mixed model literature, this is based on a series of equations called, from Henderson's equations from 1984. All right, now I look at mixed models and they're really technical and crazy and statisticians love them. Take a guess what your psychometricians came up with something similar to this. In psych of all fields. 1936. Right? And it's based off of knowledge of the multivariate normal. Right? That's cool. Right? It, the focus of psych has always been on factors. Factors have been nuisances to statisticians. So there's, there's an interesting place where SEM and factor analysis is uniquely psych in nature. I think it's a Bartlett article in 36. I think it's in Psychometrica. Um, the, there's a, a book by, um, I have the citation, and now I've lost the name of it. My goodness. 1970. There's a citation here for a book that cites it a little bit better, and that article I showed you, the link to, does it better. But this methodology is identical to what you use in mixed models. It's what you do in everything else as well. So, so what all does that mean? What all does that mean? Um, 
The posterior distribution for factor scores is multivariate normal. It means we get normal distributions. That means we can talk about error. We can talk about confidence intervals. We can do all the things normal lets us do. Um, it also makes it easy. We don't have to talk about MAP versus EAP. If you read IRT textbooks, they talk about MAP and EAP and all these other things. Heck, my textbook talks about MAP and EAP and all this other stuff. Yeah, you don't have to. MAP in factor analysis is the same as EAP because the mean and the mode and the normal distribution are identical. But more importantly, the factor score is a function of the parameters of the, mo of the model along with your data. So can we link? Now all that diversion's over. Now here comes the fun part. I'm going to link, this is what I've been building up to. We're going to link sum scores to factor scores. I thought this result was really cool. And actually it was somewhat counterintuitive to both me and Lisa, given our training. We've been told something over and over and over and over again, and it turned out it wasn't quite true. Or maybe we didn't quite understand it as well as we've been told, thought we did. So a sum score will correlate with a factor score, the mean of that posterior distribution, if you go and take the items one by one and estimate what's called a parallel items factor model for the data. Now parallel items, have you heard that in uh, your classical test theory class? Yes? What does it mean? Perform the same. For factor analysis that means uh, all the items loadings and unique variances are equal. I made a mistake here. Typo on the slides. The, the factor means are allowed to be different. Right. So our factor variances, factor, sorry, factor, unique variances are all equal. Our loadings are all equal. If you f estimate that CFA model, now you probably know how to do this in Levon, right? You put the, lo the word loading in a parentheses in front of whatever item is after the equal tilde. Same thing with the unique variance. I'm going to standardize the factor. I don't have to, but I'm going to do that just for easiness sake at the moment to show this. But if you do this model and you get the factor scores using the method I just showed you, the correlation of the factor scores with the sum score is one. I think that's cool. I'd always been told, by the way, this is dis a little bit of a disconnect for me and my knowledge of learning this stuff. I always was told a sum score assumes a tau equivalent Ever heard of tau equivalent items model, which is a little bit different than this. Really, the sum score to find the location of the sum is actually assuming a parallel items model because each item is counting the same. Right? The reliability we use tries to loosen that to go with tau equivalent. But the, the model itself, the actual location of the score is equal to what a parallel items model would give. So here, here we have it, right? Up at the top is our Levon syntax. We put a loading constant out in front. We put a unique variance constant out in front of each of the variables. If we want to get factor scores from Levon, we use the following function, predict, and in parentheses, we give it the model.fit function. It gives us factor scores. And so here, right there, is a scatter plot with a line drawn through it of all of our sum scores and factor scores. That is not a regression line. That is literally a line drawn through the middle of the scatter plot. Right? Our correlation between sum score and factor score is perfect. What do you think of that? Boom, boom, boom. If we wanted to teach you classical test theory, we should have just started with the parallel items factor anal analysis model. That's how I feel about it. Now, would you ever fit this model if you were starting in CFA? No. Why? Why would we restrict that? <laughs> but that's what's happening for your, for your score itself. Now, I want to disentangle what the score means from the factor score. I'm trying to tie factor score to sum score. How am I doing, by the way? You got it? Factor score and sum score? So this, what I'm trying to show here by induction is that if the factor score is correlated with the sum score perfectly, then this CFA model must be what's underlying the classical test theory approach as well. Right. So at the top here, I took a set of people. This is a person with a sum score of three. That means all three items were equal to one. This was their factor score. Right. So the, the sum score is three, but the factor score is negative 0.71. Now remember, it's a different metric, different scale. Right. 
But now take a look at the scores of people who had some scores of four. That means somebody who answered with a two on the last item or a two on the, the second to last or a two on the first. Each of their sum score, factor scores have to be the same. And the difference between the factor score and the sum score is 0.364. Right? So a sum score of four and a sum score of three have a difference of one. A factor score that relates to a sum score of four and a factor score that relates to a sum score of three have the difference of 0.36. It's shorter. And that is the squishing that's happening based on the factor prior. It's pushing them together, which is not desirable. Don't get me wrong. That is not a good thing when it comes to factor scores. This is another reason why factor scores have a problem. So what happens if we take, OK, now a score of 5? Right? It should still be that same unit difference between 3 and 4. It should be the same between 4 and 5 if it follows a sum score, because a 5 is one unit away from a 4, and a 4 is a one unit away from a 3. And sure enough, the factor score is 0.01, and that value is 0.364 units away. So it's cool. Our factor scores and our sum scores perfectly align. They're interchangeable, right? Variance is a little bit different, but that's a rescaling. We can rescale all we want, right? We could probably rescale this. We change the factor variance if we wanted to, and pump that thing up and make it work just right. Questions? Sorry, I saw this, my mind was blown. Because I've been always told that a sum score is a tau equivalent model, which I'm about to show you. This is a parallel items model. Questions, comments? So the first question I would be is, hey, does the model fit? Now, I've always said before, a three item CFA model is just identified. This is three items, but I put constraints on the parameters. So I freed up some degrees of freedom. So it's no longer just identified. I actually have four degrees of freedom, so I can check model fit. Ah, let's take a look. I'm in the. Uh, Robust section here. RMSCA is 0.053. If you got that, I mean, Jennifer may not reject it. She might reject it as a, a journal editor, but Devane would probably try to publish it, right, Devane? No. no I, right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, I would say, hey, it's close to fitting. Right, if you got this in a first pass, you'd be pretty stoked, right? So, at least I would. Maybe you wouldn't. So what about reliability, right? We can calculate the reliability using the variance of the factor and the standard error of the factor score squared. We know what the variance of the factor is. We set that equal to 1. What the heck is this thing? Unfortunately, in Levon or in R, it doesn't exist. Variance? Who needs that? We're just built to give you a sum. Ah, who wants a variance? In M plus, it shows up. But that's where page 35 of the slides works. I went to that slide, I put everything into matrices, and I used the variance formula, and I came up with the factor score variance itself. Sorry, right here. And I found that the factor score variance was 0 0.608. So when I put that into the reliability formula, I see that the, the reliability of our factor score is 0.73. Right? That means that 73% of variation in factor scores is due to variation in the factor itself, the latent trait, and the rest is due to error, measurement error. But what about the reliability of sum scores? I just, I didn't even tell you, I mean, I just used the reliability formula. What? We didn't have to calculate, how do you calculate alpha? I'm going to ask you this. You probably could tell me. I can tell you with factor loadings and unique variances. I'm going to show you that. Anyway. So what about classical test theory? Let's put this CFA model, let's put classical test theory into a CFA perspective. All right? We've got our total score in classical test theory. We've got our sum score in CFA. A total score is a sum of each of the item themselves. So if I replace that sum with the factor model for each of those items, I can break this into a series of sums as well. We've got the sum of the item means, the sum of the factor loadings 
times the factor, and then the sum of the errors as well. And sure enough, this portion of the model, this first portion, is like the true score. That would be our estimate of true score. Like error is still error, but that other part is true score. So now our true score is expressed in units of the model, which is awesome. All right? You see where I'm going with this now? Because now I can apply, through mathematical statistics, the variance of true score and the variance of error. And using this factor model and the mathematical statistics, I can show what those happen to be. All right? Here it is. I'm going to take the true score and the error and apply the variance function. What is the variance of the true score? Well, that's the variance of this first thing. Well, that's a constant. That goes away. Anything, there's no variance to a constant. This thing in the parentheses, ah, typo, is a, is a constant times a random variable. Because our loadings are constant, they come out on the outside of the variance and we square them. Right? Multiply that by the factor variance. The variance of the true score is the sum of the loading squared times the factor variance. What? I love that. That's awesome, right? What's the variance of error? Oh, that's simple. Um, if we have uncorrelated, if we don't have any correlated residuals, all the error terms are independent. So it's the sum of each of their variances, which is the sum of unique variances themselves. If we had correlated errors, those would just add to this sum. There would just be a sum of all the off-diagonal terms. Megan, you look like you're going to flip out. No, maybe not. Is this awesome? So is this awesome? This is how we should be teaching you freaking classical test theory. Sorry, let me back up a second. So we can put in a reliability estimate with all these things. All right, there's your variance of true score. Here it is again. Here's our variance of error. Sure enough, we do that. We can actually do it in Levon. We can have Levon estimate our reliability for us if we were to sum these items together. All right, and because the loadings are all the same, I have three times the loadings squared in this portion and then three times the unique variances. And our estimated reliability is 0.629. And not only that, when we do it in Levon with this, look what we get with it. We get a standard error around the reliability. That's our best guess of reliability. We could put a range of, that's, it's our, still an estimate. Whoa, sorry, that's awesome. I think that's awesome. I see hands on faces and people smiling. Is this cool? Am I connecting things in different classes? I hope. Or maybe I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Hurry up, Templin. We're almost done today. <laughs> it's almost beer 30. So. <laughs> All right. So here's the thing that blows your mind. That reliability that from the previous slide is your Spearman-Brown reliability. Spearman-Brown reliability was from 1910, a paper by Spearman, a paper by Brown. Do you talk about Spearman-Brown in the classical test theory course? We talk about it in terms of prophesying how many items. That might be the only thing you learn in grad school or even undergrad that was current technology over 100 years ago. There is our disconnect between how people use statistics and how statistics really is, right? We're teaching you methods from 100, 105 years ago. Get on the streetcar and learn about straight Spearman Brown, right? And on voting day, <laughs> most of us in this room won't be voting. So, yeah, that's how crazy it is, right? But we're teaching you this stuff anyway. Sorry, get off my fa my my little high my soapbox here. Quit preaching. Um, this is your Spearman Brown reliability of six point six two nine. Our factor score reliability is 0.73, and that comes also from this squishing the, the factor score. It makes it look like we have less error than we really do. The prior is shrinking the error. So it looks like we're more reliability. That is a problem, right? That is a problem. All right, how about other CFA models? Well, we fixed all the loadings here. Oh, another error in my slides. These seems to be numbers. What if we keep the loadings fixed, but estimate the unique variances, right? This now becomes a tau equivalent model. Where have you heard tau equivalent? What does it mean? I'm giving you like your CFA or your classical test theory like midterm or something. Tau, anyone want to describe tau equivalent? 
items that may have different variants but the same relation, covariance. Is that right? Correlation, maybe? Same correlation. All right. So if we do this, you know what's coming. All right. Here's our estimate. Here's our model estimate right here. Sure enough, we can get a reliability. Uh, does the model fit? First question. Yes, the model fits. Check. Move on. Here's the difference in factor scores. This is factor scores. These are some scores. Whoops. Take a look at what happens. We get a little bit of a fanning out of things. We still have a really high correlation, so it's still really related. That's fine. I'm, it's not really the point I'm trying to make just yet. I'm trying to tie all these types of sum scores together. Here's what I think is inter interesting. Here's your sum score for a 3, for a 4. When you get to a 5, there's a sum score of 5 that starts to overlap with a sum score of 6. But when you get to a sum, so sum score of 6, you may actually... Like this range right here, you start to get reversals of the order of people. All right, so when you're using the sum score, the parallel items model, you get reversals of people in ordering. Your weak order gets a lot, it's enforced, your weak order is enforced a lot more, whereas really here, you might get a reversal. Here is a person who has a sum score of seven that has a factor score less than what they should have if the factor model really is holding. All right, you flipped the order. That's where problems start to come into play. Even though the thing's per almost perfectly correlated or highly correlated. So what contributes to a difference in factor score? It's the item information. Remember the item information I talked about a few weeks ago? It's the ratio of the loading squared over unique variance. Items that are more informative count more. So if you rate one of those higher, your factor score goes up more relative to some one that doesn't. So because all of the factor scores have the same loading, the unique variances tell us how much information is each. This one right here is the most informative, GRI3. And sure enough, the factor score difference for marking it higher is bigger than the factor score difference is for any of the other two. Right. So what it's telling us, unlike classical test theory, is that it is not that all items are the same is that some items count more than others. And so here's a disconnect in classical test theory. I believe reliability came about by saying, Spearman Brown, yeah, but that's a really strict assumption. Maybe we can weaken it by giving a better reliability. And it is alpha is a better reliability. But what we didn't do was go and reorder the people on the fringe of it based on what happens under tau equivalency. Because not all items are equal in tau equivalent models. Crazy, right? Anyway, here's another crazy thing. Coefficient alpha. Here's our factor score variance, by the way, 0.727. Our sum score reliability is 0.620 using that same formula I did before. That thing's coefficient alpha. Right? Flip back a couple slides. Right here, I just gave you coefficient alpha in factor loadings and unique variances. I think that's cool, right? Everybody runs around saying, I got coefficient alpha, coefficient alpha. Do you know that they just fit this model, what they're saying? If I fit this model, this is how reliable my sum scores are. Anyway. By the way, um, if you go and look at the psych package by Bill Ravel, yet another member of the 65, in R, uh, sorry, I'm making fun of this group. I'm part of, so I'm making fun of myself. Um, he gives a nice explanation of this. Crohn's box alpha was 1951. It's identical to Gutman's lambda 6 from 1945. Aha. So not only are we tell, calling it the wrong person's reliability, it's for the wrong score. Pardon, pardon me. That's just, if we're looking, lacking credibility. Anyway, we're about out of time. In fact, we are out of time. I'm going to leave it here and pick it up. Refresh your memory on these when I get you to next week. This is going to set the stage for how to fix things. The next score itself, the next one is the CFA model, the full version of the CFA model. Questions before we leave, though? I see, like, perplexed looks. Anybody happy about this? When is classical test theory? Is it tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> so Templin says we shouldn't have this course. He just gave our course in, like, 50 slides. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, have a good day, everybody.